Ancora candele, Marco. Dai, mi sembra che sarà una veglia funebre. Solo un po' di atmosfera. Sembra un set fotografico. In effetti un po' lo è. Dai, su, posa queste candele, vieni da me. Voglio guardare. Voglio che ti spogli per me. Ma così non mi viene, dai. Ti metto un po' di musica. Io poi però lo fai pure tu. Ok, comincia. So this is a clip from, a, from an Italian film uh, that's called uh, L'amore imperfetto, Love is not perfect or something. And there's something interesting, I think, in this clip. And it's not the muscles of the guy. <laughs> there's actually a work of ours in there. Did anyone spot it? Yes. Yeah? yeah? One? OK. All your students are. <laughs> So if you look here in the beginning, OK, can you see that United thing on the wall? Yeah. There's a poster that uh, we designed a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me see if we can see it. Uh, there he is. <laughs> uh, here it is. It says, United We Stand, Europe Has a Mission. Uh, it's a poster of a movie, uh, the, but the, the movie never existed. It was a, a fake advertisement campaign for a movie uh, that we invented. We invented a movie, and we did a campaign. I don't want to actually talk about that project, but uh, it's interesting to me to see why, like, what is this thing doing in, in this film? What is our poster in this movie? Why is it there? I don't know, of course. Uh, I don't know the director, I don't know the actors, I don't know the, the screenplay. I don't know nothing about the movie. I just happened to see it by chance. And um, it could be there as, a, as just a poster. You have a, you know, have a house, you need to shoot a movie, so you put up stuff on the walls to make it more realistic. Uh, just a generic poster. No one knows what it is. No one knows that it's a fake movie. No one knows that it was designed by us. No one knows nothing about the original artwork. Or it could be there as, a, as an artwork, actually. So the guy doing the striptease is a, is a collector, and he's owning a, an artwork of ours in his own house. It's possible. Unlikely, but possible. <laughs> or, or it could be, actually, a movie poster. It could be that the director knows that the, that the poster is fake, that the movie never existed, the director of this movie, of the Italian one. And he's playing with his own audience. It's kind of a, how do you call it, like a tongue-in-cheek thing, where he's like, let's see who recognizes that during the striptease. And to me, this is interesting, not because it's a work of ours, but because uh, the, there is no answer to that question. We cannot know why the poster is there. And that actually depends on who's watching, depends on the audience. Like, depending on how much information you have, you're going to interpret it in a different way. So Nadine, for example, recognized our work. So for her, it was evident. But any of you will just see a, a, a movie poster in another movie. Uh, so depending on who is the audience, the, the meaning of the work completely changed. I like that a lot. I like works that's meaning changes depending on who sees them and where they see them. 
A painting is a painting, like what it is and what and its own, like the medium and the content is in one single object, it's one thing. If you take a painting, you put it in a gallery, it's a painting. If you throw it away, you put it in a garbage, it's still a painting. If you put it in a museum, it's a painting. It's not changing what it is. It may change value, of course. More likely, the one in the museum is more expensive than the one in the garbage, uh, but it's the same thing. Uh, with digital artworks and with a lot of the things we do, it's not like that. Uh, the object changes depending where you put it, depending on the context, and depending on who sees it. We like that. I think that, uh, I don't know why, but in the art in general, too much focus has been put on the artist and on what they do and how they do it, like the moment of, 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 of production, like their vision, their inspiration, and how they make art. And two less focus has been on the audience. Like, who sees art? Like, where does it go once it's produced? Why people see that stuff? Do they use it? Do they understand it? Where does it end up? In a museum, or in the internet, or in a TV, or in the garbage? And maybe because we don't have huge egos, like me and her, uh, we, we always identify ourselves, I would say, as much with the audience as with artists. We never made that leap of like, oh, I'm no longer a, you know, a viewer now, I'm a producer, I'm an artist. We actually never cross that line. We, we keep like going back and forth between these two things, like doing something and watching the reactions and then incorporating the reactions. Very often we use the audience as like raw material almost, as like something you can manipulate in order to make the work. So like without the audience, you wouldn't have the work itself. Uh, so in this sense, I'm not saying audience as someone who just happens to see your exhibition or read about it in a magazine or whatever, but the audience becomes themselves the, 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 the form that the work takes. We work a lot with the internet uh, since the beginning uh, and with videos, but these things, the works we did are pretty much dispersed on many different mediums. They're not all on the internet, they're not all in a gallery, they're not all in a video. They're kind of like a little bit everywhere. Sometimes even the same work could be in these different places at the same time. Mm. When I say the internet, the aspect that, the, the thing of the internet that is more interesting for us, I would say they're probably the, 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 the problems that it raised, uh, the moral or ethical problems that this mediated communication brought about, especially using social media, social networks. Uh, so not much the surface of the internet, like its shape, its colors, its design, but more what's behind it. In this sense, we could say that we're, we're not much into the web surfing thing, more into the, the deep web diving, <laughs> like going below the surface and see what's behind there. That sometimes is actually non-visible if you look at the surface of it. It's invisible. Uh, this is also why, a reason why we are very interested in the dark internet. You know, the dark internet is, is a huge part of the internet that's not visible, it doesn't surface uh, that just stays down there and it's kind of harder to reach. And uh, we find that super interesting. Mm. When we make works, we try or we tend or we're not, maybe we're not very good at creating stuff that's like monumental and big and, and iconic. Uh, but again, probably more into trying to show, to have a little glimpse of, of what's invisible, what's not there, what's absent. That's a question that we always, always ask ourselves. You know, you see something, you're like, okay, I see that, but what is it that I'm not seeing in this moment? And, and why is it that I'm not seeing it? Is it someone I, I don't want to go into conspiracy theories, but uh, uh, I think it's a very, very important question to ask yourself all the time. Once we do a work, if it's a digital or internet, whatever thing, we put it up in our website, our website is 01001011, 01001101.org. <laughs> and uh, in this sense, I would say that our website is almost like our studio. It's a place where you get to see the works whenever they are done, and sometimes even while they are in progress. Um, maybe we should yeah, start and yeah. watch a few works. Maybe we should start from like... Uh, let, me, let me see one thing. Uh, we may have gonna have a, a kind of a Q&A thing at the end, but if you have uh, questions or comments or complaints, <laughs> uh, please just do them while we talk. I like, feel free to interrupt, I really like that. 
<laughs> makes me feel like I'm not <laughs> talking to a wall. Sydney, Go Sydney. what's up? Ah, good question. You should ask it to the <laughs> you should ask it to the myself of twenty years ago. <laughs> No, that's a very good question, and I hope it's connected to the way we do art. Um, when we had to pick up a name for our website, we thought, what's the, what is something that people can really um, um, see if they don't copy and paste it, if they don't do this action of copying and, and repeating? And we came up with a name that's impossible to remember, Dolnik Franco does. So you really have to go and see it somewhere, copy and paste it. And a lot of our practice is about not being original and not being like the protagonist of our own art. So we, um, we just threw dices and that's what came out. You want to talk about work? Um, yeah, let's uh, talk about like um, an older piece in connection to like a recent one. But um, one of the um, first project we did together was called Life Sharing. This project was uh, commissioned by the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. And um, it was something that might seem absurd nowadays. It was our home computer shared with everyone online uh, through our website. So every time you type the uh, address uh, of our website, you, you wouldn't see a website, you would actually s enter our home computer. And you could see anything. Uh, this is how it looked back then. So there was this like image saying, now you are in my computer. You clicked and you could really go through all the folders and you could see our projects, our bank accounts, our um, um, music files, our private emails, and um, like whatever we had on our computer, whatever we were working on. And um, in, it's kind of strange nowadays to talk about this project because there were no social media back then. So um, it was kind of weird to do something like this. Like you, um, you usually cared a little bit about your privacy and this was totally transparent. Like people could see our private emails before we were reading them and they could see and copy whatever was on our website, including the system. We were using only free software. We were running Linux on our computer so you could copy anything, all the contents of the, the, or our laptop or our computer and you could uh, copy the system itself. So the idea was um, to abolish somehow this um, simulation that the website creates, like this is like my vitrine to the word, like I put the nicest thing. This was removing this sort of simulation and you would get directly to the content. And it would, to go back to the studio, now the website is like our studio, but this was not only our studio, it was also our home, like the place we were putting our private things. This was the email, for example, you could see what we were like buying things online, so you would see what we were eating every day. Uh, beans and pasta, pretty much every day. And um, this is some, uh, are some of the screenshots. So some were really kind of like crazy looking, some others were more understandable. And um, to us, there was no distinction uh, between what's art, what is art that we produce, and what is the tools we use to produce it. Like, everything was in the same place. Um, I don't want to want to go too yeah. deep into this project because it was really huge, but yeah. Uh, the only thing is like there were s no social media. So it's like if today you would share, it's hard to say like computer, if you would share your phone with anybody, like your contacts, everything you have. It was not an interactive website. You could only see stuff and copy anything. You could see everything and copy everything, but you could not change anything. Uh, in that sense, it's like a website. You know, anything you see, you can grab but it's not that you can move stuff around and so on. Okay. So for us also that part was very important. It's not an experiment in communication. It's more like actually two ways, but a little bit more in a, 
I would say like an exhibitionist part from our side and like voyeurism on the other side, like people spending hours reading our emails or you know, going to archives and so on, but it was not direct communication. <laughs> oh. Zero. Um, yeah, a lot. We, I think we were very naive <laughs> when we started this project. We thought it would have lasted forever first, but uh, we actually uh, stopped it after three years because of another project, which caused like, uh, yeah, us to close this. And um, and then like, uh, of course, like the first uh, the first thing that people did it was hacking our um, computer. So one day, all like the the backgrounds of all our uh, pages were uh, featuring uh, images of ships. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly. <laughs> or um, our computer was used to, to act into other people's computer. Or uh, more simply, like people were reading our emails and started answering the emails. So we know somebody who uh, got a like, commission from a museum, like answering, like pretending to be us. Or, or more simply, like journalists started to call instead of sending emails because they knew the emails would be published right away. So they didn't want to be exposed and they start calling. But we realized like the living so uh, publicly also changed our way of behaving. Like you can't really ignore your scene con constantly. Even if um, there was not much, like there were no, almost no photos online back then. So it was all text. And like and a little yeah, most bit of it was of documents yeah, and music emails and so on, so and so bank so statements. Exactly. I remember um, Ito Steil, you know, the writer and artist, uh, when, when she saw the project, she's like, what you guys are doing is abstract pornography. <laughs> like there is that pornography thing of like revealing everything, like raw content, but it's also abstract because there was you no know, really very few photos of us or, or, or any that would be considered prurient <laughs> sexually. So when we were working on this project, we also started working on another project, but it took almost 10 years to finish it. We're very, very slow. Um, and um, so we realized like some people who tried to share like uh, music online but they were using like peer-to-peer -peer system um, um, they were sharing more than um, they, they thought so um, through very simple hack like something very stupid we realized we could enter people's computer so it was somehow the opposite of uh, what we were doing with live sharing with live sharing people could enter our computer and we realized we could enter other people's computer and um, so we started copying their files and documents and everything and at some point we just we decided to copy just the images so the internet evolved in the meantime and there were tons of me images available, like private photos available on this computer. We started to copy them and we became sort of obsessed with this idea. We were waking up at night trying to see if we could find some other photos. And we decided to stop at some, when we reached like 10,000 images, we said, okay, enough. Like we were getting like really mad about this. So let's just turn these into an art project and, and finish with this obsession. So we made another project called The Others. And um, uh, with these 10,000 photos, we um, made a slideshow. Uh, maybe, maybe I can show like a few minutes of it. The whole slideshow is very long. It's like more than two hours, more, almost two hours and a half. Um, but I'll show you yeah, like I think, a few um, minutes of Yeah, it. just a couple of words before we watch the slideshow. We chose the slideshow, of course, because it's a kind of the vernacular way mm -hmm. for people to show their own photographs. Uh, like nowadays, you know, nobody does slideshow anymore. Like probably you don't even, you never did a slideshow in your life. But, you know, my mom, when she comes back from vacation, she would do a slideshow. <laughs> and I have all the parents, you know, people coming over the family and watching a slideshow. Uh, so we kind of like that, that very popular way of showing these images. And... Uh, the only one trick, the only one thing we did technically uh, to the slides is usually slideshow are, are, are super boring also because they are kind of repetitive. You know, you give it a time to each frame, it's like a second, and then boom, 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 boom. And we had 10,000 of these photos, so it was too long. Uh, so we decided to give a different timing to each single photo uh, from like very fast one to slower ones. 
So the slideshow, the rhythm of the slideshow is a little bit trying to replicate the rhythm that we were going through when watching these photos. Like, you know, boring, boring, cat, 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 woman, <coughs> or boring, boring, accident. Like, you know, you see something that's interesting, you slow down, and then you get bored again, you go, you speed up, and so on. So we try to keep that kind of pace in the mm -hmm. slideshow. And then one last thing I didn't say, it's uh, we, downloaded all the photos from these private computers and the music and surprisingly we realized most of the, these people had, um, were playing um, very, very famous songs and just doing a like, cover version of these songs. So we thought about using these songs as soundtrack for the slideshow. But we should see it otherwise. Yeah, I'm going to show you seems to uh, three upset. minutes of that. The big, the well, the beginning doesn't really have a beginning or an end, but uh, so you get an idea. If you think to it, like each weekend, millions of people take millions of photos. Some of the f these photos will um, probably end up on social networks. Some of them will make it to a website. But most of these photos will remain invisible in the memory cards. These were invisible photos on people's computer. I think not even their creators, not even the people who took the photos saw them. And there's not much distinction between these photos, which are private, and public photos. Like they're the same photos you would find online.
my photos are exactly the same as this one. So the distinction between a private photo and a public photo, private life and public life is really becoming blurred, more and more blurred every day. Um, but we, this work, we didn't want to mock these people. I think it's a sort of like celebration of, um, of everyday life. Um, we could be the protagonists of this. Like it's called the others, and um, each of us is the other of the others. So it could be anyone. Um, um, Can we read you a? There's a, um, there's a nice quote. There's something we we'll like to read sometimes about um, the imaginary audience, the fact that each of us is thinking there is an audience out there. And Do you guys ever heard of imaginary audience? It's like it, no? <laughs> I mean, neither. Like it's, so the imaginary audience refers to an egocentric state where an individual imagines and believes that multitudes of people are enthusiastically listening to or watching him or her. Though this state is often exhibited in young adolescents, people of any age may harbor a fantasy of an imaginary audience. <laughs> this is an old definition. Uh, of course, I guess we should now update this to like <laughs> people of any age <laughs> may like totally harbor a fantasy of an imaginary. <laughs> it's like a, a slight disturb of personality that's becoming uh, like uh, the norm for all of us. Like this is a state where we all live, or at least I live, it's imaginary audience. <laughs> Yeah, it seems like the internet is running on uh, exhibitionism on one end and, and voyeurism on the other. Mm. Or... Uh, yeah, or like, a, like narcissism and, uh, and like, what's the opposite of narcissism? Huh? Sorry. <laughs> and masturbation. And masturbation. And masturbation, yeah, yes. possibly. <laughs> yes, we should come up with I, I'm not happy with exhibitionism no, and narcissism. I'm it's sure, like is there any like psych psychiatrist? I don't think so. I, I, I want to talk to a psychiatrist. Who, like, I'm sure there's like a better definition. You should on talk to a psychiatrist. I should talk to a psychiatrist. <laughs> I suggest it. Um, um, we or, also yeah, sharing and spying. I don't yeah, know. that's I another like way of putting it. Um, we also show uh, these, these works. So this is, for example, a way we would exhibit this, this projection, the others, in a museum context. Uh, so it's this uh, like a wrong projection. It's kind of tilted and it's on the door instead of the wall. And uh, it's like wrongly keystoned. So again, it's like <laughs> we're trying to replicate that vernacular way of showing a slideshow. This, we set it up as if my mom would set it up. So did, we could say like so many things about uh, putting pictures of ourselves online and the way it's um, um, somehow changing our, our society. We do put images online to show that we have been somewhere. Like, do you, you know this way of saying like pics or it didn't happen. Like if you don't show you have been to, uh, to a party, uh, it's as if you haven't been there. And um, um, you actually, go there to prove you've been there, you go there to uh, sort of create your mediatic uh, existence, like to, you edit your media, mediatic existence, uh, like celebrities used to do in the past. Now everyone is involved in this process of um, shaping the way uh, we uh, think people should see us. And um, again, like to go back to Ito Stare, which we quote to the nausea, like our students know, um, she, um, she said that, uh, something really funny in a text, like, have you ever um, put a photo of yourself naked online? Congrats, you are immortal, because that picture is going to stay there forever. No way that like, you're going to be able to, to take it off the internet. So yeah, one big issue in the future will be how to disappear from the internet, how to More than um, <laughs> yeah, add, edit our pictures out of it. Um, you want to move to something else? Yeah, yeah, maybe let's, let's move on. We'll see a few projects. And if you have questions, again, like, feel free to ask. Do you guys have any questions right now, or should we move on? It's two, uh, more than two hours, 10,000 photographs. 
I mean, it's, it's of course a super big theme and topic, and, and uh, I'm already a little bit old for that, probably. Uh, like, I'm, it's, this is more of a problem of the next generation, I think, because uh, I was a, when I was a teenager, the internet was not there, and that's exactly when it would have been really bad for me. <laughs> like, uh, I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of stuff that's really way over embarrassing. It's really problematic. Uh, if I would have been a teenager during the internet, if that stuff would be out there now for you to Google on me, <laughs> I probably wouldn't be here now. Uh, <laughs> and so I guess this is more a problem of, uh, you know, of you guys, <laughs> or even yeah, people that's younger than you, like managing your reputation, managing your online visibility or something. And uh, I guess that goes with education as well. I guess it's gonna be kind of parallel to what kind of education you got. You're a richer person, come from a rich intellectual family. You're more likely to have a really good internet reputation you come from a poor family, less educated family, uh, you're more likely to have a bad internet reputation. Like, and, you know, no yeah. one ever told you if you are drunk and throw up at a party, don't get your, you know, don't get a picture of that. If you do coke, don't get a picture of that, don't put it online. But also we're talking about the, like images are kind of the surface of things and Franco mentioned before, like we all always try to um, like go deeper and see like what's uh, uh, below the surface and uh, I don't think it's uh, so much a matter, like a problem of pictures. Like uh, the problem is um, every time we are using a device. I mean, you um, every time you're using a phone, you're being um, geolocalized. You you have been uh, sent uh, uh, unwanted advertisement. You are being tracked you're being spied. So um, I think the pictures are just the surface of, uh, of this problem. But uh, yeah, it's connected to the fact that technology is now um, everywhere and we can't really do without. Well, I just think that we were not kind of not really prepared for that though. Like in, in the past, you know, people who had this kind of visibility of pressure was like celebrities or politicians, somehow artists maybe, or actors, but they were also, most of them, good at managing that, that image, that pressure. Uh, not all of them, you know, the, the history is full of cases where they, they, they imploded on their own image, like, you know, Marilyn Monroe or, or Kurt Cobain, I don't know, people who suffered because they, they didn't manage anymore their own personality or something. Uh, so. Like, I think we are kind of all wrapped up in this game now. It's just that we're not good at that. <laughs> so we, we need to keep up with that. Like how, you know, the, the moment you put a lot of information about yourself out there, you also need to be aware of the consequences of that. How people perceive you. In a sense, it could also be interesting because then you get a little bit more, uh, you get a glimpse of what it is to create uh, a, a persona that's like creating almost from scratch. So you get a glimpse of what it is to be like a politician. Uh, you kind of get a, 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 a you can see the mechanism from the inside a little bit. Let's talk about being someone else. Talking of, about yeah, being someone else. Yeah, focusing too much on ourselves. Let's talk about being someone else. Um, um, yeah, again, like I said in the beginning, uh, we are not so interested in the act of production on the, on the authorship of like uh, auto reality, like I'm an artist, this is my <laughs> thing, I have a vision uh, and I wanna show it to the rest of the world. A little bit more in what happens before and after that moment, like where this stuff comes from and especially where it goes. Um, we used a lot of different aesthetics in fact in our, in our like, making art. Uh, we never really created our own aesthetic, our own style, recognizable style. Uh, so for example, one of the first work we did is we, we pretend to be the Vatican. We created the fake website of the Holy See uh, back in the 90s where this was still possible. And we created a fake website of the, of the Holy See. So aesthetically it would be exactly the same as the official one. Uh, this, is the, this is it, that's how it looks. Uh, but then if you go through it, the text that were in there was light, they had like little minor modifications. Nothing that was like super offensive or super explicit. Uh, no swearing or nothing. But a little, you know, we were like pulling in like a few small ideas that we kind of thought were, were we really believed in these little ideas. Uh, example, uh, contraceptions. You know, Catholic Church has always been against uh, contraceptives, okay? 
and we thought uh, we changed our mind. You know, from now on, you guys can use it because HIV is spreading, so it's good to use contraceptives or uh, light drugs. Uh, you know, why not? <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, but it was, it was amazing to see that just because the surface of it, the aesthetics of it was believable, people kind of believed it. They didn't, uh, just because of the aesthetics of it, the, you know, the power of the images. And another, uh, or yeah, like another time we, we, we did the work using the Nike, the true company aesthetic. So we made an advertisement campaign that looked like Nike had done it. It was a kind of believable, like, like designed to be believable. And the idea was that Nike just bought a square in the center of Vienna, capital of Austria, and they just changed the name from, from Karsplatz to Nike Platz. <laughs> so they now owned it, and uh, as an advertising campaign, they just renamed it after the company. And uh, of course, people got really upset and, and complained <laughs> and, and so on. Uh, so same thing, it ju we just tried to, since the Vatican or the Holy City thing worked, we, we tried to make it a little bit bigger and go out from the internet to, in the streets and see, will this work? Is it really just, is, is it like creating a believable enough aesthetic enough to pass as, as like a huge corporation? And it worked, just for a little while, but it worked. Mm. Another time we, uh, we invented an artist. Uh, it was the beginning, we had to, you know, we were starting probably like younger than you guys. <laughs> and we, we needed to make, a, we need to make our art. You know, it's time, school is over. You need to become an artist, find your aesthetics, find your, your, your way and following it. And we were like, oh, I don't really know what I want to do. Uh, like, why should I need, you know, I'm too young to choose what I want to be in. I don't want to grow up old, blah, blah, blah. So instead, we created a, a, a whole artist with a personality, with a biography, with a, some artworks. I would and go through very quickly because there are very gruesome pictures here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And um, you can watch it online if you are like uh, uh, more, more morbid, like, like we are. <laughs> uh, so we created an artist because it was, and we felt it was very liberating. Like, uh, because you, you're still, we wanted to make art. So this is a, a way of, way you have to create, if you have, you have a creating an artist, it has to be stayed together. You know, the, the story needs to be kind of believable enough and interesting enough for people to be interested. And, uh, and that's the craft part of it. But at the same time, you're not yourself. So uh, we find it very liberating. You know, I'm not, this is not stuff that I have to like defend against all the criticism or the studio visits. <laughs> uh, it just sets you free to be someone else. Um, yeah, then at one point he became too big and, and uh, people wanted to meet him and we got invited to the Venice Biennial, so we killed him. <laughs> so we got rid of the problem. We didn't show him. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's a long story, but uh, that, that's enough, I guess, to get it. And then uh, we recently used, uh, we, we, we decided to, to, to use the aesthetic of a living artist. Uh, instead of inventing one from scratch, we, we decided to use the aesthetic of uh, 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 an artist that's famous enough and we and see what happened you know I is it possible for you to like understand the work of an artist and aesthetic of an artist and, and add a new work to his or, or is it totally impossible are these guys really as genius as they seem to us as as mythical and so on uh, and so we chose uh, Maurizio Catalan he's an Italian artist we know his work very well maybe that's why we've always been really interested in his work and uh, he, I guess you guys are all aware of his work, right? He does a lot of, uh, right? Is anyone who never heard of Maritza Catalan in the past? Raise your hand, don't be ashamed. You never heard of him? Okay, he's a big guy, like one of the maybe 10 living artists or something. And he does a lot of uh, taxidermy animals, works that are kind of funny and surreal at the same time, uh, weird and very photogenic. Like people love them, people take a lot of photographs and, and he, that's also why, and, and they, they're very expensive. You know, a thing like the, this could be like a million dollar or something, like super. Uh, so, Maurizio Catalan. We learn where, where Maurizio Catalan uh, builds his own sculptures, like where the, the guy that does his taxidermy for him. And uh, we, we, we went there, uh, it's a taxidermy in Italy. And we, so we had, you know, we had the aesthetics we had the tool, the person to make it, the craftsman, and we just needed a, an idea. And you know, since we're not genius, not like big artists, we just decided to get something from the internet. And the internet has always helped us, and uh, in the shape of an epic fail, lolcat <laughs> in the cage. Uh, we thought this could, be, could have been a Maurizio Catalan work, 
you know, it was funny, but not so funny. Uh, weird, a little bit uh, creepy. Uh, somehow liberating or something, you know, the little parrot. Like, uh. Anyway, we sent this photograph to the taxidermy guy and he did this thing. Uh, so the one before you saw, that was a photo montage, like a Photoshop thing, you know, 2D. This is an actual object, this is a sculpture with a real cat. It's dead, but it's, it's real. It's a tax, taxidermy cat. And a real bird, dead bird, taxidermy bird, <laughs> in a real cage. Now I say this because uh, a few people, when they saw the object, were like, oh, I thought it was a Photoshop. Uh, they thought that even the, 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 the work was, yeah, forget about it. it it's, yeah, it's a sculpture. <laughs> then we, we exhibited it as a, as a Katana sculpture. So without our name there, our name was nowhere. This was an official exhibition of Maurizio Cattelan new work. Uh, so of course, collectors are scolding. It they was a collective show, so it's I show. kind of believe that, well, it's difficult to put up an entire show of an artist you are not, but it was inside a collective show. Yeah, we did a bunch of other works and, uh, and people wanted to buy, of course, collectors, because Cattelan is very expensive and a lot of people want it. And, uh, we, the, the, the gallery, the owners of the gallery, they knew that it was a, of course, they were doing this kind of thing together, so they knew what to say. They would just say that the work was already sold. Uh, people reviewed the show and, and they, they liked it. They, you know, most of the reviews were good, like uh, using the usual uh, rhetoric that critics and curators use about masterpieces, like the usual subtle, ironical, subver slightly subvertive Catalan <laughs> style, uh, style sign and, and so on. And, um, and then after, after about a month, we, we revealed it, that it was not, you know, not only that it was not actually Catalan, but it was not even our work. It was actually me coming from the internet. So it was kind of a, you know, a, an anonymous image that was produced as a, just for, for, for fun, for, for, for the hell of it really, uh, by some anonymous guy on the internet, that just for the fact of becoming like a real object in a, in a, in a white cube kind of a institutional space, suddenly becomes you know, a masterpiece. Uh, that, the context of it turns it from being something that's just funny to something that's like interesting, uh, worth reviewing, wor worth photographing, worth paying a ton of money to buy. Of course, once we reveal it, the price dropped <laughs> dramatically. Uh, but some people came back and review it again, this time you know, with, with this extra layer added on top. I was surprised of how cool they, they were with the idea. Uh, I guess they accepted it, uh, first of all, because they, they, they knew us, so they, invite, they wanted to make a show with us in the gallery and they kind of uh, you know, expected. And second, because the whole plan was kind of planned out clearly since the beginning. You know, we, we didn't want, we're not art forgers. We didn't want to sell it or, and it was very clear that after a while we would have claimed it as ours. Basically, we like we have a show. We do half a show as a Catalan, then other half a show as ours. So uh, you know, they knew that they could go back to all the people that inquire, all the journalists and so on, and be telling them. And they were, they, you know, they thought hopefully they're gonna understand why we did it. And uh, as far as I know, no one got really upset. Yeah, I think we were involved in the show. Sorry. Um, I think we were involved in the show because the, they knew we had been uh, working a lot on like giving up our own identity and like be someone else uh, for like to make art works of ours. So um, they expected probably something along these lines. And also, yeah, the work itself was about how art gets produced and uh, how art is perceived and, and circulates and not much of like a prank on people. I mean, you wouldn't be able to know it's not a Catalan if you didn't know. So. Uh, we were not making fun of people saying, oh, now they believed it and now we tell them it's not true. It's more like, of course, on the one end, it's um, the old ready-made thing that you put it in a gallery and it gets uh, the context to create, uh, makes it believable on the one end. And um, how things start outside of the gallery with the meme and how, um, like you as an artist, you're more of a filter for things, like, art happens through you in a way. Like things happen outside 
you just decide to pick up an image and make a sculpture out of it and then it might also go again outside of the gallery space and in fact it happened with this piece because um, after we put the documentation of it online, the photo of the cat, somebody made this. So it started circulating again online as a meme. So yeah, I think it's interesting, it's kind of constant flux. It, it's, I, I, I think it's interesting, it's more than, again, that creating like iconic monumental works, just seeing how things can keep changing, uh, where they come from, you know, it's, it's a, whatever Catalan looking sculpture, but it comes from an online meme. That is itself, who knows where that comes from, who photoshopped it and who made it. And then it, uh, you take the image, it becomes a sculpture, people photograph and it comes back to the internet as yet another thing. And, and uh, like documenting all of this migration, uh, that to me is the most interesting part. Yeah. Well, that, that it's, uh, it's something I kind of already, like, that, I all, that I always suspected, but you may also be just delusional, you know? Like, I'm a genius, and when I die, people's gonna recognize me. Uh, maybe not, <laughs> maybe you are. Uh, I'm more for like the other way around, like, hey, there's no genius around here. <laughs> uh, anything has been, is kind of more or less a reformatting of what's already been out there, and uh, I'm not saying that, you know, there's no creativity or no, uh, or, or no quality in art or anything. But it's, again, I'd rather focus my attention of, of, the, of the influences that every single work has, both before its production and afterwards, rather than on a specificity and, and the geniality of the single artist. Uh, because I think that, uh, that, is, that part of the art has been really uh, overblown for uh, too many, for too long. Celebrating this myth of the artist, that, like inspired and see something that other people don't do. Uh, uh, it's he, another he, good question. <laughs> yeah, he, he. Well, first of all, he didn't sue us, uh, which is I think it's uh, it's it's uh, stuck. He didn't sue us. He didn't make any lawsuit. He didn't attack us legally. And he actually, uh, we we didn't tell him nothing. We just published the work, and then the moment we sent out a press release, we sent him an email. We thought that was the, the best thing to do. Like he's gonna know, he's gonna be the first to know, but like ride together with the rest of the world. And he replied with a super nice email. Uh, so he was, uh, uh, that's also something I really appreciate about him that even if he's like becoming that, such a big artist, he still keeps that kind of lightness that a lot of artists lose when they get older and more established, more recognized. Uh, they like, they like to play around when they're younger and experimenting and then when they get established, they, they're gonna be like, okay, now, uh, you know, I'm a serious guy. <laughs> I'm gonna sue everyone. <laughs> and, uh, so he said something about, <laughs> he said something along like, oh, you guys yeah, are too much a ahead of our time. <laughs> yeah. like that. Wow. So I, it seems like a compliment. Maybe it was an insult. <laughs> so no, <laughs> no, let me make the thing to it. Okay. Um, Let's move on. Yeah, we're super yeah. late. We're very late. Sorry. Super late. I, I said it from the sketch. Like, we're real slow. Um, uh, let's talk about a totally different work. Yeah, this uh, is a very recent work. This is, I think, one of our last projects. It, um, it's called Emily's Video. And um, it started with, um, with another project we did. We always work like that. We do something we're not happy with. And then we make another version. And it's kind of better, we think. So we did this um, work called No Fun, in which uh, we staged Franco's suicide on a um, chat forum, and we filmed the reaction of people seeing it in real time. And, um, but when we, I, we are not gonna show this, but when we saw it, we thought, okay, we made a mistake because um, the reactions are so interesting in comparison to Franco's thing, they're just like doing nothing. So, we, we thought maybe the next project is gonna be about, just about reactions without the, the, um, the work itself. The work itself will be invisible and the reaction will be the work. Um, so we put a call online for, um, we were looking for people to um, see the worst video ever. And if you reply to this online call, um, a girl named Emily, uh, who was our assistant back then, would come to your place with a laptop and show you the video and film your reaction with a webcam. Um, 
So Emily went to all the <laughs> places, like all the apartments, all the people who answered the call, showed them the video, filmed them, and um, after that, we destroyed the original video. So there's no way to see the original video anymore. Um, the only way to see it is through people's reaction to the video. And, um, Which we edited together in yet another video. That's the only thing that now is accessible. I'm going to show you uh, a couple of clips from that. Uh, the first one is uh, three minutes long is the beginning. I feel like I want to watch it under the covers. Okay, that's great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's seriously what I want to do right now. Okay. And I don't even know what this is, but... Okay, I'm about to watch Emily's video. I'm about to watch Emily's what video. I'm about to watch Okay. I'm about to watch Emily's video. Alright, so I am about to watch Emily's video. Here we go. Alright. You ready? Are you ready? Go. Will you think less of me if I watch something that you don't watch? No. <laughs> Stop making me. God, you you are awful dogs. Hi. Um, I'm going to watch Emily's video. We're in New York City in the East Village, and uh, I'm about to watch Emily's video. Oh, you know what it reminds me of? This Dali film. <laughs> you know? Yeah. The razor blade in the air. Yeah. And Shannon on the loop. Yeah, it's horrible to chop up the videos, but... Um, so people could, of course, leave at any moment if they didn't want to watch it anymore. And towards the end of the video, um, it becomes uh, way more uh, sad and tragic, if you want. So this is a, a one minute from towards the end of it.
Like we never answered any question that's related to the original video. You have to be happy with this second-hand experience. Absolutely not. There was very little context. It was a super short online call for, that said there is this video that is really horrible, really graphic, really explicit, that no one is supposed to watch. Like, it's gross. But if you still want to see it, you should call this number. And, and, and this call got like forwarded to people, sent it to friends and so on. So it very quickly became like detached from us. So people did not know that it came from us. And even if they, I don't know most of these, of the viewers, so they had no context at all. For them, it could have been even a, you know, a sex appointment with, with a undercover prostitute for what they know. You know, this Emily girl is gonna come to your apartment or something. Uh, yeah, in fact, there were some awkward moments. Yeah. Like, I went to people who thought it was a sort of uh, date or an appointment. With yeah, her. because, you know, it's this girl from the internet coming to your apartment with a laptop showing you a video, it's, it's a little bit shady. But I guess that, that's what we, we, we didn't want, you know, all our friends being in there watching it. We wanted it to get out to uh, an audience that as broad as random as possible. They knew they were filmed and they could leave any time. That was the agreement and they could decide if they want to be alone or with Emily while they were looking at the, watching the video. And, um, but um, we very often film with webcams and we like because they're considered like intimate, like private cameras. But in fact, we realized they're, um, they're very intrusive in a way because you forget you're being filmed. Like you don't see them, it's not like being filmed with a huge camera, like they disappear and you act really spontaneously. So I think that's uh, what we wanted to achieve. And also um, all of them were filmed very like private settings, mostly like their apartments or their bedrooms. And um, so there is this very intimate feeling and um, yeah, I'm very like sorry we had to chop it because it's uh, uh, 20 minutes, but um, if you see all of it, there's sort of, uh, um, there you can kind of tell the story of what's going on because they, they talk and they give some hints about what they're seeing, which is um, on the one hand they say something, on the other they're kind of mystifying it because uh, they, some of them focus on details of the video. So you think it's about these details, but in fact it's just details. And, um, and we love like poor images. We like this um, very uh, blurry effect that the webcam creates. And uh, yeah, I hope webcams will never be very good cameras and <laughs> we won't lose this poor image quality. Well, I guess since it's a kind of a, for us, this, this webcam aesthetic, for us meaning like, like all of us is, is somehow still new. It's only, you know, 10, 15 years old we still identify like poor images with something that's authentic, I think, maybe subconsciously. Uh, the moment you see something that's so raw and so grainy and the quality is so bad, the audio is so bad, you kind of take for granted that it's real, that it's not you know, a production with actors and so on, uh, which is something we, we, we aim at. Uh, there is this theory of uh, you know the open work of art, where uh, an artwork that's that's uh, as opposed to a closed work of art that that's uh, so. For example, if you see a a painting of a woman crying and she's uh, holding a dead baby, that's a, a closed narration. Uh, it's a little bit is a traditional way of telling a story. Like you have all the elements for you to put together a story. She's crying because the baby died. Uh, that's a closed narration. Open work of art is an artwork that's uh, actually missing a, a big part. So let's say you get that same painting and you crop out the baby and only keep the, the face of the woman crying. Uh, that's more open because uh, the moment you see the like, hey, uh, like very instinctively asking yourself, why is she crying? And you come up with a solution. Uh, there is not a solution. It's not a rebus that you have to figure out. 
every person will interpret it in a different way, of course, depending on expectations and, and, and so on. Uh, so an open work of art is a, is a work where there's something that's very strong, like a big part of the story is just missing, it's not there. And I actually really like a lot artworks that, that rely on that because I find it one of the difference between, uh, uh, let's say, art and entertainment. You know, entertainment usually, uh, like everything is packaged. Like you see a Hollywood movie and you get the whole story. Prequel, the action, consequences, and so on. So you, know, you sit down, eat popcorns, and watch it and enjoy it. Uh, most of the, uh, the, the, the artworks I, 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 I kind of am more interested in don't have that kind of completeness. They, they lack a lot. They miss a lot. And that hole, uh, you have to fill it up with your, with your, with your imagination. Uh, and of course, you fill it up depending on who you are, where you are, in the mood you are, uh, your, your fear. Uh, in this case, of course, if you ask anyone, if I would ask any one of you what is the worst video ever, anyone would have a different opinion. Uh, we got a lot of very strange requests when we wanted, uh, from people who wanted to see it. A very specific request. For example, uh, I'm totally up for seeing it unless there's kittens involved. Like, if there's like kittens, I don't want to see it. <laughs> so we would ask, are you okay with uh, child pornography? And they would be, yeah, yeah, sure. If there's no kittens, I can see it. <laughs> or um, uh, I want to see it unless there's fingernails involved. If there's fingernails, I don't want to touch it. And again, we're like, yeah, but how about uh, torture of uh, animals? Yeah, 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 sure, anything, but not fingernails. <laughs> so I realized that everyone had his, his very personal phobia, very personal idea of what the worst thing ever is. If I think to the worst thing video, the worst video ever, I do not think to kitten. I would think to something completely different, which I don't want to say here because <laughs> make me look like a perverted <laughs> freak. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> no, Franco. <laughs> um, so, um, there is this, this, this beautiful text by philosopher Danto, Arthur C. Danto. Uh, you probably, maybe you read it, the, the book he did recently called, uh, what's it called? The Danto book? The, the, uh, the one on the invisible, what art is, what art okay, is, yes. where he, uh, he, he's, he's, he's thinking why is it that every definition of art is never, never satisfy us. Like we keep you know, making new and new, new definitions of what art is. We've been doing it for hundreds of years. And they always get, update, they always get uh, outdated very quickly. And then we make a new one, and then it gets updated, and then we make a new one. Uh, and he thinks that uh, the reason why all these definitions were, were failing at the end by any you know, philosopher, art historian, and critics is because all of them focused on, on what's visible about art, on the aesthetic of art what you can see about it. And apparently there is nothing that, that's visible that all artworks from all eras share. You know, it just changes too much and too quickly. Uh, and so there is nothing really, there's not a common ground visually. So his conclusion, his logical conclusion, well then what makes art art, it must be invisible. Uh, so if you cannot see the difference, aesthetical difference between a Brillo box that's done by Warhol and an actual Brillo box in the supermarket, but they, they do are different. It means that that, that difference is not visible. It's not in your, you, can't, you can perceive it with your eyes. It's something that your eyes cannot see. So it's, it's, it's invisible. And what you don't see is actually very powerful, uh, sometimes more than what you see. So yeah, as much as we're trying to disappear as artists behind um, other identities, in a way, mm. behind pseudonyms sometimes, behind our institutions or other artists, we, we used to, like, we, we sometimes um, identify with. Um, we're also trying to make our artworks invisible or show the invisible part. Um, so most of the times we are trying to avoid to show the work itself, but uh, the reactions. So the like reaction, using the audience as reaction, a yeah. Yeah, the audience yeah. reaction as the work itself. So without the audience, the work doesn't exist. It's not just people watching an artwork of ours, but the, the experience of watching it is the actual artwork. Without audience, there's no work. Like usually, you do art because you want to reach an audience. In our case, like we reach an audience to make art. Oh, to finish up, um, the, we, when we show this video, it's usually on this like big uh, screen, which is flipped, and most of the screen is actually black. And, uh, and the video is just on top of it. So um, 
And, and, when and the, the video is placed, like in this case, this would be the entrance of the, of the room. So you would come from yeah. here and you would see this monitor from, from You'd the back. You see a corner of a monitor, you enter the room and, uh, and you can see the screen and the video. So the first thing you would see is usually somebody watching the video. And uh, when you're watching the video, you see yourself reflected in this uh, black part, a sort of black mirror. So you see a video of people watching something, and while you watch, you see yourself watching. Does that make sense? I hope so. Uh, so we exhibit these works in like in different ways. They're not we're not super, you know. We consider that they're, they're they're digital works, so their nature is is uh, unlike paintings. Like we said before, they they are uh, malleable. How do you say that? Um, you can reshape. Re mal reshapable maybe or something uh, portable let's say portable they can change you know uh, so we're not big fans of like giving super specific instruction how to sh the work must be exhibited that way uh, we're more flexible we actually change it a lot depending on the context so in this case for example it was uh, in the middle of a room uh, leaning to a column keeping the same concept you would enter from the back and see the back of it before you see the front uh, but we also showed it uh, in, in cinemas, for example. This is a, a cinema here in New York, like a normal theater where you would go and, uh, and you would see this strange, super low quality webcam video. And of course... Uh, I'm sorry, and in the making, we were putting up clips from people's reaction on YouTube. So ah, yeah, of course. first you would see people's reactions on YouTube, like these little clips. And then we got, after like some time when we had collected all of them, to the final edited version. So this is yet another version of it. It's all uh, clips from, you know, single clips. You know, we don't we do not consider any of these versions like the official work. Uh, they all make the work. And they also speak to different audiences. More likely in an audience that see them out of context on the internet on YouTube. They will just see them and being kind of maybe laugh at it or being like surprised and thinking that this is kind of weird internet phenomenon that they didn't know about. Uh, people that see them in a gallery is more likely more informed that they're going to read the press release. They know that it's an artwork of some sort. People seeing it in a theater is probably half away in between. Some may know a little bit more than others, but and we like that kind of a, uh, again having reaching different audiences in different contexts and, and hopefully the work is going to kind of uh, adapt to all of them. Well, uh, a painting, wherever you put, change the context, but the work, is the w it's, it is what it is. It's that painting. But the video is... No, the video, depending on how you execute, is going to change. Uh, like, a video projected is not the same thing as a video in a computer, and it's not the same thing as a video in a monitor. It changes dimension, changes the audio, changes the color. I mean, the context changing, but the object does not change in itself. I mean, it's, it's oil on canvas. Like, the dimension of it, it, it coincides with the medium. It's the same thing. You cannot take off the image. Well, first of all, I'm not saying that, you know, this is better than the other. I'm just, like, it's just a medium thing. Uh, when, when you have a digital file, uh, you have a, a piece of code, like zeros and ones, a number, basically, that, that human being cannot interpret. Is a file. You need something like a technology to interpret it, to execute it. So in that sense, uh, every execution is going to be different because every computer shows it in a different way, uh, again, different scale, uh, different formats. I could make a text out of the video file and still would be the same work. Whether why a painting or a drawing or, or an object does not, I mean, it gets old or something, but But that's a, a change in in, that's a change in medium. Like, I'm taking medium and turning into another medium. Well, in this case, what I'm saying is, with a video, you cannot but execute it and change it. While with a painting, you can change it, but you're not obliged to. You can even just keep the painting. You can keep a sculpture, and it's a sculpture. With a video, you cannot keep the video because it's a digital video. With a film, yes, like a, a film strip is a film strip. With a digital file, every time you see it, it it's an execution of that thing. And, it's different because the hardware, the computer changes, and so the interpretation of it changes. I mean, it's weird. You get almost philosophical with that. Uh, 
But again, I know I'm not saying, of course, most of people would think that this is a problem, not a plus. This is a problem that digital has, that it, you're relying on a technology in order to see the actual thing. Because without the technology, you can't see it. Like a painting, we can see it with our eyes, while with a video file, you cannot see it if you don't have a computer. Uh, so in that sense, we could even think that it's, a, it's less evolved. Of a, a, Uh, no, I'm not saying, it's, it's just two different things. When I make a sculpture, I make something that stands there, people will see it, turn around it. When I make a file, I know that people will need some tool to interpret it. And they're different. And I think it's, it's silly to make one look like the other. Uh, no, it's silly, it's just, uh, uh, I, don't, I think it's more interesting to understand what you're working on and it's, it's a plus and it's, you know, it's virtues and it's problems. And I think that the virtue for me of working with digital is exactly this broader possibility of interpretation. Like, uh, you know, again, the same video can be put in a theater or on a computer, can be spread on the internet and so on. And that's something you cannot do with a, yeah, I think uh, like the, with a drawing. Yeah. I mean, sorry to interrupt you. You could do with a painting, but with a documentation of a painting, not with the thing itself. I can't send that original thing in the whole world. No, you, can, you, can, you cannot have a million people watching the same painting at the same time. Oh. It's like impossible, you know, in the whole world. It's not a matter of curator or artist or... or this, I'm, I'm, think, I'm talking about the, the painting, not the reproduction of the painting. You can have a million people seeing a photo of the painting, but then you get in the digital realm, it's a whole other thing. The primary experience is going to be you seeing that painting. While in the case of a digital file, the primary experience, anything is a primary experience. Like if I see it in my computer from home, if you see it here on Projective, if you see it in an exhibition, it's the same thing. Every experience is a primary. While with a painting, the person, I think, who sees the real thing has a, is privileged. Like, you're seeing the real thing. Everyone else is going to see, at best, a documentation or a production of it, a photograph. I guess what I'm trying to say is, uh, you, you, every, every time you see it, it's going to be different, whether or not you like it. It's not a choice. It's implicit in the medium. Like, if it's digital, every execution is going to be different, whatever. Uh, there's not going to be two people in the world that's going to see the same thing. Yeah, but even the same computer, uh, because the, the, you know, the luminosity of the screen changes, the connection to the internet changes, uh, the hardware changes. Uh, it, it's a very, I, I mean, it's a very simple thing. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm making it bigger than what it is. Okay, enough with digital. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Maybe we just we got stuck to this, this discussion <laughs> to the yeah, curators. We're going to have this problem whenever they have to pick up a painting or a digital work or a video. Um, yes, I think yeah, we showed a few pieces. So um, if we're, Yeah, let's wrap this yeah. up. Um, we're done. Let me see. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>